policy, copyright policy, privacy policy, need to collaborate <coughs> with other fights in other parts of the political battle. And they need to collaborate with an insight from this American, Henry David Thoreau, who in 1846, while living at Walden Pond, wrote a book on Walden that has a passage as follows, quote, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who is striking at the roots. Well, the point is to recognize that, I want to speak here about the American democracy, if we linked, if we linked together all the areas of public policy that we think the government is just systematically getting wrong, and asked ourselves, is there a root to these mistakes? Is there a root cause to these failures? In the United States, at least, I would say there is a root, and that root is a kind of corruption inside the political system. Now, I don't mean by corruption, brown paper bag corruption, where cash is secreted among members of Congress, buying votes or buying privilege. I don't mean Rob Lugoyevich kind of corruption, where try, people try to buy a Senate seat through privilege given and political context. But instead, instead I mean corruption relative to the ideals of a constitutional baseline. So that baseline, specified by our founders, is this. The founders of our constitution gave us what they call a republic. But by a republic, they meant a representative democracy. And by a representative democracy, they meant, as Federalist 52 puts it, a government that would have a branch that ought to be dependent upon the people alone. So here's their model of government. We have the people, we have the government. I do my own slides. Right? So the people and the government. This is the model, this marionette-like relationship, this dependency on the people defines their government. The problem is, our Congress has evolved a different dependence. Not just a dependence upon the people, but increasingly a dependence upon the funders of campaigns. Members of Congress now spend between 30 and 70 percent of their time raising money to give back to Congress. And they develop, as any of us would, while doing that, a sixth sense, <laughs> a constant awareness about how what they do will affect their ability to raise money. They become, in the words of the X-Files, shapeshifters as they constantly adjust their views about what they know will raise money, not maybe on the issues 1 to 10 in their local jurisdiction, but on issue 11 to 1,000, issues nobody will even notice, but which will certainly guarantee them access to the kind of money they need to fund their campaigns. Leslie Byrd, a Democrat from Virginia, describes that when she went to Congress, she was told by a colleague, quote, always lean to the green. And then to clarify, she went on, he was not an environmentalist. <laughs> now the point is, this is a dependence too. But it's a different and conflicting dependence from a dependence upon the people alone because, surprise, surprise, the funders of campaigns are not the people. In the United States, 0.26%, and you're thinking I'm a lawyer, I don't know about percentages, but I really do mean 0.26%, one quarter of 1% of Americans give more than $200 in a congressional campaign. 0.05% give the maximum amount allowed to any congressional candidate. 0.01%, the 1% of the 1%, give more than $10,000 in an election cycle. And 0.000063% have given 80% of the money spent by super PACs in this election cycle so far. 196 Americans have given 80% of the money spent in the presidential super PAC fight so far. So the Occupy Wall Street people are so proud of that we have the 99% slogan, that market, right? We have the 99.74% or the 99.95% or the 99.99% or the 99.99997% which of these numbers you want to take as the baseline, people who don't have the access that the other side has because they don't fund their campaigns. Now, this is a corruption, and this corruption has an effect. Number one, it leads Americans to believe, and I think Americans are right to believe, but it leads them to believe 
that, quote, money buys results in commerce. 75% of Americans, according to a poll that we commissioned for this purpose, believe money buys results in Congress. A little bit more Democrats than Republicans, but I guarantee you before the Republicans took control of the House, there just as many Republicans as <laughs> So whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths, here's the one thing all Americans agree about. Money buys results in Congress. Leading to point number two, that belief erodes trust in this institution. Gallup found in last year that 11% of Americans have confidence in Congress. They then thought that number went up, but the New York Times reported just last uh, fall that it was only 9% of Americans who have confidence in Congress. And we should put that in some context, 9%. There were certainly more Americans at the time of the British Revolution who believed in the British crown than who believed in our Congress today. And that leads to point number three. This low trust erodes participation. Rock the Vote's an organization that registers and turns out young voters to elections. In 2008, it turned out the largest number of young voters ever in the history of an American election, and I think certainly, therefore, guaranteed the election for Barack Obama. In 2010, they discovered a significant number of their members were not going to turn out and vote, so they pulled them to ask them why. And the number one reason by far Two to one over the second highest reason was, no matter who wins, corporate interests will still have too much power and prevent real change. And it's not just kids. The vast majority of Americans, 60% of Americans who could have voted in 2010 did not vote, in part at least because of this belief. Now it's my belief we have to find a way to end this kind of corruption. And that until we do, we will constantly see public policy decisions being made in the way that this cockroach is moved, a constant erosion by people who are willing to fight this endless war to the ends that benefit the very narrow fiscal, economic interest that they advance, regardless of its effect on the interests of the public in general. Now, I would never try to persuade someone that they should look at and understand this fundamental corruption and make this their first most important issue. I'm not saying give up your concern about copyright regulation or global warming regulation or healthcare regulation or some way to deal with the financial crisis. Don't give it up, but make this issue your second most important issue. Hmm. Because there's a potential here that we're beginning to see, because of the character and response of the internet to this kind of corruption, that if we could get more people to focus on this as the second most important issue, something about this second most important issue could change. The potential here is huge, or really, really huge here. That's big, huge. And I think, again, the model is the transformation in power that we saw advanced by the fight over SOPA and PIPA in the United States. Last December, Senator Dianne Feinstein, one of the most powerful Democratic senators from California, proposed a meeting with the copyright industry and the technology industry to discuss SOPA and PIPA. And the Hollywood industry wouldn't even send a representative to that meeting because as the leading lobbyist said, we don't need her help. We have a commitment by more than 60 senators to support this bill. Within two months, that commitment had been flipped so that millions, because of millions of Americans and people from all around the world, not just Americans, fighting and raising a ruckus about this, those 60 senators disappeared and the bill was defeated. The most significant defeat of Hollywood's most powerful lobbying machine in the history of that industry. Now that defeat came from a certain kind of coalition. People on the left and the right, driven by hackers and activists and 21st century company, companies, and crowned, I think, by the decision of Wikipedia to shut itself down in the United States for a day in protest on this bill. And once that protest occurred, again, the change in Washington was inevitable. It was the net that beat them. Now that's pretty extraordinary, given the architecture of American politics and the way incentives work in American politics. 
I mean, I know we've seen the net do extraordinary things around the world. This is extremely important spring, uh, Arab Spring that, of course, in part comes from the activism enabled by this net. But this spring is a war against freaks and dictators, people like this. And you might say, well, we should be able to beat people like this. This was a war against Hollywood, against all the money in the world, and the net beat that. Now, I submit this is incredible, and it's unimaginable, at least unimaginable to me circa 1998, that that activism could have this effect, that the outsiders, organized by hackers, would have that kind of effect. And I think it points to a potential. The potential is that this infrastructure enables what Hobbes would have said about giant waking up. The giant, meaning the sovereign, who most of the time spends his time sleeping, can, because of this infrastructure, be pulled back into a political battle and have an effect. And once the giant wakes up, the giant represents all the power in the world to these political regimes. And so as we think about the potential of all this power in the world, the third lesson here, and I think ultimately the most important lesson here, is a way to knit the movements around the internet into the movements to end and change this corruption, not just in places that, like the United States, but everywhere across democratic government that is right now failing to demonstrate and deliver to ordinary people a sense that the government is responding to the people alone. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for your attention.